Uh, we're super excited to have uh, Richard Baitlick back. Richard spoke year one, if I, if I remember correctly. I think I followed him year one. He's always a tough act to follow. Um, so we're super excited to have him back again. So without further ado, I'll go ahead and hand it over to Richard. Green light. Well, thank you very much, Rick, and Mike, too. I heard Mike isn't here right now, but thank you to both of them for inviting me into SANS in general. I was thinking about when's the last time I spoke at SANS, and it made me think about the first time I spoke at SANS, which was in March of 2000, when I was still wearing the uniform, and I spoke about what eventually became known as backscatter. And you know, wow, talk about something that no one even cares about these days, but uh, that's how it goes. What I'm going to talk to you today, uh, talk to you about today, uh, is a story that all of you are part of. And it's useful, I think, to look at this story, see where it began, where it's going, and what might be some implications of it. It's, it's underappreciated in some ways, but in other ways, we're right in the thick of it. Uh, I was looking at, for example, all the summits that are coming up, and it seems like there's one for everything now. We've got this threat intel one, there's a SOC one, there's, there's just this proliferation. So we're in this tornado of cyber and threat intelligence, and you have to say all those things because we're in DC, right? Uh, or near DC anyways. But what I want to do is bring to you a perspective that steps out of that for a, a moment, and takes a look at it, and then gets right back into it and talks about where it might be going. Right. Uh, right, side. right side. There we go. Whoops. All right. So I'm going to give you the bottom line up front so that if you only want to remember one thing, here it is. So we're in the middle of a revolution in private sector intelligence. I'm not going to talk about the capabilities of the fort or what can be done on the government side. I'm talking about the private sector, where I imagine many of you are from, and that's where I am right now at FireEye. And I'm not an intel person at FireEye. I don't do that work. We'll have one of our intel people come up. She's awesome. Um, I have to leave right after her talk, but I made sure I could see hers. Um, no disrespect to the other speakers, but um, definitely wanted to see that. This revolution in intel is being driven by five factors. First is imagery. And initially, the imagery that caught my attention was commercial satellite imagery. And I'm going to show you some wonderful examples of that, what can be done with it. But increasingly now, we're seeing imagery taken by smartphones as playing a key role. I'm going to give you some examples of that. And beyond even that now, we have imagery from drones. And when you put these three together, it's pretty amazing. Second one is experts. And this is where you come in. We have people who got their start in this field many times in the government, uh, or in the military, which is how I did it. Um, but what's even cooler now is that those people are in the private sector and they're training new people who are coming into completely private sector intel shops who have potentially no training whatsoever and they're teaching them how to be real intelligence analysts. And those new people don't have any military or government training. So we're starting this whole new industry out of the, completely within the private sector. Let me jump ahead to jobs. The fact that there are jobs to be had is what is really exciting to me as well. You don't have to go work for one of the 17 intelligence agencies if you want to be an intel person. You could go to school, get a degree in either a you know, technical field or a, a social field, an area expert, and you could go work for an intelligence company. You don't have to go work for the government. And this is a big problem for the government, by the way. Collaboration. What you're seeing now is places and interactions between people of different skill sets. And that's being uh, facilitated by software in the form of cloud forums and social media. And I'm going to give you some examples of that. And what that really does is it gives the chance for some people who are still inside the formal Intel community to mentor unofficially people on the outside. And in some cases to confirm or deny while hiding behind a pseudonym or a handle, which can be very, very useful. So the bottom line about this is 
there are definite benefits to this. And I'm going to show you them, but there are also some costs, and we don't know how to handle it yet. So let's start the story from not necessarily the beginning, but I'm going to show you my beginning because it will set up a contrast between where we've come from and where we are and where we're going. So um, March, uh, let's see. I graduated from my master's program in the June of 96, and I went to Intel school at lovely San Angelo, Texas. Do I have any Texans here? Love Texas, right? Go Texas. Um, I graduated with, uh, I was a 14N, if anyone knows what that is, Air Force Intel. Um, I learned things like how to interpret imagery. I learned how to handle classified information. I learned not to put it on a server that I deployed myself. Uh, I learned that information is classified even though it bears no markings. Um, I learned not to take markings off of classified information and transmit it as if it were unclassified. All sorts of useful skills that would have benefited someone else, apparently. Um, but this was how you became an Intel person back then, is you went to school, and you, this school was nine months. It was the, basically the second longest or the longest school in the Air Force. I think only pilot training was longer. And after that, I was, uh, well, I, I want to say I was sent, but I had the choice of jobs, and I, w I went to San Antonio, Texas, where I w went to Air Intelligence Agency, uh, the commander there was a guy you might have heard of, Mike Hayden. So I worked for him. In the fall of 97, you might remember we were involved in all sorts of conflicts in the former Yugoslavia. And there was a need to send intel analysts over to this place called Jack Molesworth, Joint Ana Analysis Center Molesworth in the UK, uh, to the targeting shop so that we would pick targets and then strike them. And the preparation I got for this job was, this is just a four-month temporary duty TDY. The preparation I got for this job was that book that you see right there. That's the cover on the far left, and I still have it. I forgot to bring it in. I'd love to use props, but I, I, I forgot it. Rick told me he was actually downrange when he was in the Army. He, he still has his copy of the same book. So in this book, and you can see a picture a little bit inside, you have maps, you have images of weaponry that's involved. Um, a little bit of the conflict between the different sides and so forth. This, was, this book was published in February of 97. I got my copy in, uh, I guess, when I went over there in September of 97. This was state of the art. The fact that you could get a handbook and you could read something about this conflict before going over there. Prior to that, the only knowledge I had of the conflict was what I could read in the newspaper. Um, I, in May of 97, I started subscribing to The Economist, so I was able to read some decent open source about what was happening, but that was it. There was no Wikipedia, there was no um, Strat4, there was no private intel, there was nothing out there to read. But so this is what I had and this is what I worked with. One of the operations we did there was counter propaganda against what one of the factions was, was doing. They were sending out all sorts of vile messages out over the airwaves inciting people to hatred and kill others and so forth. So our commander put a request out and said, we want to take down the Serbian communications network. How can we do that? So my shop took a look at it, and we, we had our classified imagery on our classified systems, incidentally, which I was building a website on top of, a classified website, that had targeting folders. And this was state of the art. You know, We weren't using pieces of paper. We were going to use a website with HTML. Uh, so the fact that I could code in HTML was a huge deal back then, which basically meant I knew, knew how to use an ahref tag and uh, tr and li and a couple of other tags like that. So the product of, of our work there was not rather than bombing these stations and putting them out of commission, S4, the, the, the um, stabilization force, rolled tanks up to each one of these six targets that we identified, walked inside um, and told the Serbians, hey, stop broadcasting. And they said, okay, fine. So that was a counter-information warfare operation that was handled with physical forces. And there's a paper that's there, and I've, I've put references throughout this whole thing, because I know you're enthralled and you want to look up every reference and follow everything, right? So that was an example. Oh, and, and that picture there is from, um, I think it's from Stars and Stripes. The, the next day there was a picture of one of the towers that was taken down, and we looked at it and we were like, oh, that, dude, that's, 
Duga Neva Hill in Unit 619 and all that stuff. We were pretty excited. Okay, so that's where we were back then. Last fall, I'm sort of keeping track of geopolitical events because it's what I like to do. I don't really cyber these days. And I see this incredible story about the Russian buildup in Syria. And it's firsthand reporting by a guy in Turkey. Well, I didn't know he was in Turkey at the moment. But this guy who was watching naval vessels pass through the Bosphorus. And he's taking pictures. And he's putting them on the internet in a blog post. And I looked at this and I said, this is amazing. And he's not just taking pictures like, oh, I'm a tourist. He goes through and he catalogs them all. What, what vessel it was, what markings, when they passed through, whether they were going north or south. And he has this data going back for years. And I read his bio and he says, oh, this is the thing I do for fun. And there's other people that do the same thing. And I thought, this is amazing. This guy, I mean, 20 years ago, we would have been paying this guy to do this work. And he's doing it for free on a blog. Now, when I first looked at this, I said, Bosphorus, did he misspell that? Because I thought Bosporus, just with a P. So, of course, what do I do? I Google it, and I get a map, and I look, okay, well, yeah, I knew it was at a body of water. Let me zoom out. And I zoom out, and it's where I thought it was. It's just, it's the strait that passes into the Mediterranean eventually. And the ships would go from uh, up in Russia and down through and over to Syria. So it struck me. I said, wow, this is just a window into this world that's out there, this revolution in private sector intelligence is happening right now. And there are people like this guy who's taking these photos. He probably doesn't even know he's part of it. He's just taking photos. He put them on the internet. So I thought for a second and I said, you know, I wonder if there's imagery of that hill in the former Yugoslavia and what does it look like? How far back does it go? What, what changes have occurred? And I was able to use Google Earth. Again, if we had had Google Earth, 10, 20 years ago, oh, unbelievable. So, you know, we had to task satellites back then. We had to put in a request and maybe two months later you got an image and it's blurry and you get it oriented. And no, I click on a link and boom, I'm looking at four years worth of imagery here. And so you can see the progression of, of September of 07, April 11, 2011, 17 August 2012. And you can do some comparison analysis. It looks like they've, they've put another tower up there's some activity there. This is, this is amazing. Um, when I had to get imagery before, I had to sort of beg, borrow, and steal anybody I could talk to to task a satellite to get a photo. And here, if this isn't sufficient, I just pay it. I pay money, and I get the picture taken. And there's even an app for that. One of these, one of these satellite providers has an app that you can do on your phone. So you can task a satellite from your phone to take a picture. This is amazing. So when I, when I did that four blocker there, it reminded me of something else that was in the news recently. And this is the uh, Chinese buildup of so-called islands, which are more or less just like rocks in the ocean, but they're turning them into islands. And they're turning them into islands to project their maritime claims forward into the South and East China Seas. So this is another example of using open, sec or open source imagery that you can buy from Digital Globe or elsewhere and doing timeline analysis and seeing visually the buildup of these forces. And this speaks a thousand times more than reading some Intel report or a newspaper story. When you put a picture like this in front of a decision maker, that grabs their attention because they can look and they say, huh, that used to be pretty and green and natural and now there's a runway, and they're putting uh, AAA guns and other things. So let's move into another area of what you can do with this analysis, or what, what you can do with this analysis. You can do economic analysis using this open source data. Here's an example uh, from the 38 North Project, and they're one of my poster children for the revolution in, in private sector intel. They do things with, with imagery that I didn't think you necessarily could, uh, or I hadn't heard of people in the private sector doing it. So what they're looking at here is a section um, uh, of North Korea where it connects to China. And they're trying to use changes in the terrain there to show whether or not there is an increase in economic activity. So 
the two photographs on the left are a pair and the two photographs on the right are a pair. On the left, the top left photo, you see essentially nothing. It's like a field, dirt, mud, whatever. And then the photograph below it shows within, what's the time difference there? Uh, just a few months in 2015, a whole bunch of activity. Warehouses built, a pier, et cetera. This is an indicator that there is academic or economic activity going on. On the right, you see something similar. The same guys from 38 North um, did some really cool analysis showing how there have been factories being built in North Korea, but they're getting their power from China. So they're looking at, they're looking at this commercial imagery and they see a factory and then they see a little dent in the woods and they just start following it. And you can just imagine they're just sort of scrolling their mouse, scrolling their mouse, scrolling their mouse, and they're following the line. And then they say, oh, this is now over the border. And they follow it, follow it, follow it, follow it, follow it. And they realize it's some Chinese businessman who doesn't trust the North Korean power grid. So he cut a, a swath through the forest, ran his own cable, essentially, to keep electricity flowing to his uh, power plant, or his, sorry, his uh, factory in North Korea, where he can get cheap or potentially slave labor, um, but have reliable Chinese power. And you can use that to determine what's the relationship between the two countries, what could potentially be changing, and so forth. That's all just from imagery. Now, this is where we'll get out of the economic, we'll get what I think is a little bit of the cooler stuff, and this is where you talk about open source military an analysis. So it seems like every once in a while, somebody finds some cool new military gear in commercial imagery. And this is another example from 38 North, where they found a new North Korean submarine where the submarine is, and they can figure out things like how long the submarine is, how big it is, uh, if there are torpedo tubes. When they see a canopy over part of it, they assume that it's something they're trying to hide and what they can make some assumptions about what, what's worth hiding, even though you can't see it. Okay, maybe there are uh, other missile tubes back there, different diameters or different kind of missile and so forth. Um, and then they can take that information and render a diagram, which is what they did in the lower left-hand corner. This is what we think this submarine looks like. Let's switch over to Syria for a moment. If you haven't seen the Institute for the Study of Wars work, their stuff is just top notch. In fact, most maps you see on CNN and newspapers, they're all ultimately derived from ISW. In fact, the ISW folks are often briefing the Pentagon about what's happening in Syria because their, their stuff is so good. So here you have a completely open source group located just a few miles away up in DC who is tracking what's happening in Syria. And it doesn't come through here, but one of the really interesting projects they're, they're doing is they go through social media like nobody's business. They follow all of these uh, jihadis and such on Twitter and YouTube, and they have language experts, so they understand Arabic and these other, you know, other languages because it's not just a, uh, an Arabic phenomenon. And they're tracking the changes in these groups and figuring out what they're going to hit, and they're debunking some of what they say in terms of um, uh, they claim uh, responsibility for a target, but they didn't really hit it, and so forth. Now, the, uh, the lady who runs ISW is married to an analyst at AEI. And so AEI has been taking a look at what's been going on in Syria as well. And this is another example of one of those just priceless photos that says a lot. This is a picture of, a, of an airport runway in Syria. And it shows uh, the, the plane that's in the middle there. That's a blow up of the one to the right. That's an Su-34 fullback. It's a ground attack aircraft. Doesn't, it's not exclusively ground attack, but it, that's the role most often it's, it's used for. Um, this is significant because, first of all, this level of imagery that you can identify the aircraft is awesome in the open source world. Um, secondly, there are only 93 of these in the world. It's re a replacement for the SU-24 Fencer, which is a 1960s era uh, ground attack airplane, where there's thousands of them. So if the Russians are sending, oh, and this, this uh, SU-34 was only put into production in 2014. So the fact that they're sending their frontline ground attack fighter tells you they're not fooling around. 
They're not sending their garbage planes to this. They're sending their best stuff. You also see above that an IL-76 Candid, which is their strategic airlift, which means they could pull in tanks, they could pull in armored personnel carriers, uh, they could just bring in troops or supplies as well. But catching this stuff and then measuring it over time gives you an idea of what's happening in, in Syria, potentially, with the Russian involvement. Let's, put a, let's take another little, little deviation from just sort of tracking what's happening. Uh, you probably have seen differing reports about whether or not the Russians are really fighting ISIS in Syria. They claim that they are. Other people are claiming that, they, that they're not. You know, the U.S. government is claiming that they're not, um, at least mostly that they're not. So what's the truth? So uh, there's an open source intel analyst who goes by the handle Bellingcat. His real name is uh, Elliot Higgins. And he decided to crowdsource the problem. So this is a combination of all the things that we just talked about. We, we have the imagery, we have the analysts, we have software, which I'll show in a second, um, all coming together to say whether or not this is really happening. Uh, are the, you know, who are the Russians bombing in Syria? And by the way, that's Russian footage that was released via RT, their you know, Russian television. Um, it's got that Gulf War feel to it, right? Remember how all that looked back in 91? So the, the Bellingcat analysis used this, this open platform uh, called Silk, where you can just upload your data to it, and then people can use it to analyze. You guys probably know. I've never used it, so you guys probably know what it is. Um, but as a result of their analysis, they found out that about 45% of the Russian government claims to be hitting ISIS are true, 40% uh, are false, and 15% is unknown. So at best, the Russians are, you know, it, it's, it's at mixed result whether or not they're really hitting ISIS targets. So I think this is pretty powerful, that you could have a completely third party influencing potentially U.S. government, you know, other government policies based on their open analysis of imagery and other information. Now, this took a lot of work, and as you might be expecting, there's even a possibility that you could screw this up. And I'll get to that at the end as a risk of this type of analysis. Pivot a little bit. Talked about hitting ISIS. If you haven't seen this report, this is pretty amazing. This is the George Washington University's uh, program on terrorism. They put out this report called ISIS in America. This, to me, is the story that the current administration doesn't want to tell because they want to project we're winning, JV squad, you know, Obama's coasting out of here on a high. Well, meanwhile, we got this big problem. And this report spells it all out. And in the description of it, they talk about going through uh, more than 7,000 pages of legal documents. They interviewed people. They interviewed families of radicalized um, young people. This isn't, this isn't just, you know, I sat back, I read some newspaper articles, I put some glossy marketing together, and I sent it out. They did a ton of work on this. So very, very impressive. This just gives you sort of a hint of it. They do profiles of, of various uh, radicalized individuals. They show a bunch of social media excerpts. They give you a real flavor of what's happening out there. And I wouldn't be surprised if this is better or at least on par with anything that's being circulated in, in the closed community. The good thing about this is, and we'll see this with some of the other reports later that I mentioned, they're something that the public can talk about and not be afraid of um, busting a security clearance or being at risk from being prosecuted because the, you know, the Obama administration is the number one They've gone after more leakers than anyone else in history, which is uh, a little scary if you're in this field, I think. Now, unfortunately, I'll turn briefly to the, the Paris attack. And what struck me about this, besides the fact that it was just a horrible tragedy, was that almost within minutes, people were trying to figure out what happened. And I want to say within hours, someone had produced this graph of different elements of the attack, uh, identities and so forth, and put it on the Internet. Now, I, f I found this through Twitter, and then I went to this website, but can I trust this guy? I mean, who, who is this guy? I don't, even, I don't even say who it is. I just, um, I linked to the Critical Threats page where I first saw it. Um, 
this starts, you know, it starts to make me wonder, you know, what are your sources? Can I trust you? What's your record? What's your reputation? You just can't go in and say, oh, this is real because it looks pretty and it's nicely laid out. I mean, there's a certain amount of that. If it's just drawn on a napkin, maybe I'm not going to pay as much attention. But if it looks like a lot of work went into it, that might have a little bit more legitimacy. But as, you, as I mentioned, it sort of hints at these questions you need to ask, which we'll get to <coughs> in a moment. Let me pull in the collaboration aspect a little bit. There are, if you're not into this world, you know, I don't spend a whole lot of time here. I just dip in and out. But the level of collaboration that goes on in the open source military analysis field is just amazing. Um, I was looking at uh, laser and railgun development in China because, you know, I'm so exciting to, to talk about those sorts of things. And the level of detail that people talk about is just remarkable. It tells me these are people that work in this field. They probably work for the manufacturers or they work for the consumption side. You know, they're on these Navy ships with, it, with the rail guns. Um, and they can talk, you know, they don't just talk about the, the, the Chinese capability. They say, well, that looks like a Navy such and such. It has this range and so forth. And the way that they can get away with it is they don't put their real names. So they use a pseudonym so they can hide and not reveal that, yeah, I work at Northrop or Lockheed or wherever, uh, and, but they could still contribute to this dialogue. So I'm sure this is a field day for the other side, but for our community, I think it's valuable as well. Okay, I got to say the A word. This is a cyber threat intel conference. We've got to talk about attribution. I'm tired of hearing about how hard attribution is. Oh, it's so hard. I work in cyber. I can't do attribution. Try getting out into the physical world for a minute, right? Little green men. In fact, I have a real little green man. Look how little that guy is compared to the reporter. This is from um, March of 2014, I think is that tweet of mine? Yeah, March 1st of 2014. I watched this news report on CNN, and this reporter who speaks Russian, uh, this is actually a theme you'll see, language expertise, subject matter expertise really matters in this field. She's talking to this soldier who's in, who's in uh, Crimea. And she just asks him, where are you from? And he doesn't know any better. Look at him. He's probably like 17 years old. He says, I'm, he says, I'm from Russia. Oh, whoa. Well, they didn't expect that, right? I hope this kid's okay. Um, but he basically, you know, he just outed himself. He doesn't have any of his flavor. He took off all his patches. He, he's, he's a little green man. He's not, um, he's not identifying via, via the signals you would use in a traditional military operation, but when asked, he doesn't know. He's like, yeah, I was sent here. I'm from Russia. Um, so this is where I get to one of my two reports that I brought with me. You can't have them, but they, you, I do recommend strongly reading them. This is the Atlantic Council's report called Hiding in Plain Sight. And this is one of the two reports that really motivated me to do this talk. Um, this is an incredible open source analysis, basically proving that the Russians invaded Ukraine. <laughs> no, no two ways about it. Um, and the level of detail and the techniques they use, I've never seen anywhere else, except for in the closed world. And I'll try to give you some examples of that. They do things like tracking individual vehicle movements from Russia to Ukraine. How? The soldiers take photos and put them on Facebook, or the Russian equivalent of Facebook or the Russian equivalent of Twitter or wherever. So if you know where to go and you can speak Russian and you can see pictures and you can recognize serial numbers and do things like that, you can track these things. So guess what? That's what these guys did. And this is where the attribution piece comes in. When you are putting your life on the internet, attribution becomes easier. I'll give you some examples. Two unfortunate examples. Um, these two there's a young man in the top left, and then there's a young man on the right. Actually, he's, the guy on the left is also in the right-hand side picture. They didn't survive their encounters in Ukraine. These are Russian soldiers who deployed to Ukraine, despite being, you know, the Russian government denying that this happened. They went to Ukraine. They died in combat. And, um, you know, their families grieve their loss now. And the report goes through and talks about reading their social media posts, where they are, what they were doing, what unit they were from, the aftermath, um, reporting, uh, you know, the, basically, once you have that little hint of something, and this is where, you know, you probably remember this from the cyber world, once you have that little hint of something, that thread to pull, you can find tons of stuff. That's kind of, the way I like to think about it is, you know, OPSEC is this wall 
but it has like Niagara Falls on the other side. And as long as you get one little crack, the whole thing is just going to just explode. So that's what happens here. You get this little insight, and then you suddenly pull in all these threads, you pull in this torrent, and you've got this whole guy's life story. And it's enabled by those factors I showed earlier. The most important one in this case is these soldiers are documenting what's happening to them as it's happening. It's not um, like in the Civil War where you basically have letters from, from home you know, that I can read years later. This is all happening right now. One other part of this report that just totally blew my mind away. The analysts figured out where the shells were coming from by analyzing the burn marks in the ground, the direction that they were being fired from, estimating the type of weapon that would cause such a mark, pulling the range back and figuring out that the firing positions were inside Russia. We used, that, that's an army thing, right? Who learned how to do that? It's probably some army person who's now in the private sector working in Atlantic Council. Whatever, just, just amazing. Okay, I talk about how to do that. Finally, there's not just little green men, there's little blue men. They're Chinese, and they're in so-called Coast Guard vehicles. But guess what? They're not Coast Guard vehicles. They're essentially paramilitary vehicles who are out there enforcing territorial claims. So I wanted to mention that as well. Okay. Yeah, attribution can be hard in the physical world as well. On the left... We have a criminal who is trying to break into the same drugstore for the third time, and they still don't know who this guy is. They eventually will find him and they'll prosecute him. So don't tell me attribution is so difficult. The physical side world does it all the time. On the right-hand side, we have conflicting stories about where the Russian shootdown occurred. The Russians say, oh, no, we were that red line. We were swung way away from Turkey. And then we went towards Turkey. Then all of a sudden we realized we needed to go south. And they went south, which I don't think necessarily happened. The Turk line is the purple one, which shows that they, the Russians cut across that little peninsula of land at the bottom, but I don't necessarily think that warranted a shoot down. So figuring out what happened is difficult in the physical world as well. Okay, I have a few minutes left. Let me pull in the cyber side. I'm going to take you through a quick tour of what I consider to be the highlights now of the revolution in private sector intelligence from the computer security side. I think it started in, in March of 2009 with a GhostNet report. This was the guys up in uh, Toronto who are now um, part of Citizen Lab and doing all of that work. They continue to do wonderful work. This was the first real expose of Chinese activity against the Dalai Lama and other dissident groups. So just, just over seven years ago. So this is where you know, we're inside this, this revolution right now. Fast forward a little bit more than two years. We have the um, Shady Rat report. Dimitri, his guys, not a very large report, but this definitely put the attention once again back on the, on the Chinese side, at least. Um, fast forward about two more years. It's funny how these big milestones, in my opinion, come out about every two years. We have the Mandiant report, so that's going to be uh, three years old in about two weeks. And the thing that I think that, that struck people about this report was there was a building. And once there's a building, a reporter can visit it. And the reporter can try to run into his taxi and tell the driver, go, 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 and try to speed away from the Chinese soldiers who are chasing them. And the taxi driver wusses out and stops, and the guy gets pulled out of the taxi, and it's all caught on camera. That's what's great about that report. Go ahead two more years, and this is where you need to look up back there. Mr. Rich. Yes. I'm going to give you some really good props. This report, how many people have read Camera Shy? Oh, okay. Everybody's hand needs to go up. You need to read Camera Shy. I'm going to talk about this one because I love this report so much. This, to me, is uh, one of the best reports. And to me, this is like the, the high point right now of, of this integration of private sector intel that's occurring right now. I think of it so highly, I had a color copy made and bound, and I carry it with me, and I love it. Okay, so what is so great about this report? Well, if you don't know about this report, uh, it came out last fall, and basically uh, it was a combination of DGI and Threat Connect and a little help from Passive Total. Uh, they completely doxed this Chinese PLA guy. That's just the easiest way to put it. Um, they uh, revealed what this unit 78020 is doing, and what they were able to pull together exemplifies a lot of the points that I've made um, just now. 
they eventually, because of some technical analysis, were able to pull the thread and identify an individual. Now, this had been done before, right? We, uh, with our uh, AP21 report, we had different persona that we talked about, but, but this report really digs into this one guy. And this is basically a laundry list of what not to do if you're trying to hide your identity uh, when you're doing PLA computer operations. So this guy, I mean, his whole life is on the internet. You see him there with his pet. He puts pictures of his car because he's so proud of it with his license plate so you know where he lives because license plates are just like they are in the, in the States. You can identify that. He talks about his bike. Like, apparently, he's an avid cyclist. He talks about trying to sell his bicycles. Um, this is where you guys really blew me away. This is reminiscent of the hiding in plain sight report. So I mentioned in the hiding in plain sight report that they were able to use burn marks and camera angles to figure out where the shells had come from. Well, what these guys did um, in camera shy is they took a look at photos that uh, Mr. Gu had posted and figured out where would you have to be to take that photo. And they realized he would have to be in the Technical Re Reconnaissance Bureau headquarters of Unit 78020 in order to get these different angles, which I was just thoroughly impressed. You know, here's a picture from the inside. Come on. I mean, you just, you place this guy at his building. That's even better than just saying, here's the building, in my opinion. Now, I have to put a little shout out for Kaspersky. Um, I like Kaspersky, but they sort of like jumped the shark with this. This to me, this is their APT tracker. This is also what looks like the, great, the craziest game of Battleship I've ever seen. <laughs> Um, <laughs> I went there just to see all the different groups they were tracking, but I had to take a screenshot. This is the new, like, Pew Pew Norse map to me, um, which I have to be careful of. FireEye has one, obviously. Um, but I like this one from the uh, Kaspersky side. Quickly, uh, a couple of things that I'm tracking now. I am very interested in who else is writing these so-called APT-style reports. Two, two companies I'm paying attention to, uh, Chihu360, a Chinese company, um, they probably outed a Vietnamese hacking team with the, uh, one of their reports. Um, that was Ocean Lotus or Sea Lotus. Also, um, Anti Labs, and let's see if we can, there we go, Anti Labs, uh, they believe they found someone. And it's so funny, because they saw evidence that Cobalt Strike was used, they decided to try to dox the guy who created Cobalt Strike. Uh, they found apparently his page on Black Hat and used that as his bio in their report. Uh, that just copied it verbatim. So that's it, you know, the Chihu360 report's probably a little bit better than this one. There, you know, but it, I like to see the, the development over time. I'm gonna close with talking about some risks. So trust is an issue here. I saw a tweet come up from Bellingcat and he talked about whether or not there were cluster bombs being used in Syria. And he went to a video. And so I read, I looked at that and I said, well, I don't really know what cluster bombs look like. Um, and it's sure enough, there's this huge back and forth between these two analysts in the video comments, like, you're an idiot, no you're not, you're an idiot, no you're not, I'm not, whatever, about whether or not there are cluster bombs being used. So you just can't trust what you see. Just because Bellingcat said it doesn't, doesn't make it true. Secondly, some people just go too far. Um, this is an example from Malware.lu, it's a group up in Luxembourg, who were so inspired by the APT1 report, they decided to hack the Chinese. And what they said was, when I first read the report, it looked like they had taken the IP ranges that we had listed in our report and scanned them for Poison Ivy servers, exploited the public vulnerability in them, and then found all kinds of stolen data. So it turns out all of that is true, except the IP range part. What they did was, the IP ranges are the ones in the middle table. Those are from the APT1 report. The ranges at the bottom are from their report. They just picked out IP ranges in Hong Kong for whatever reason, I don't know, and just scanned those, found all the vulnerable Poison Ivy servers, exploited them, and of course they found stolen data, which I thought was you know, interesting. But to me, this is, this is going too far. Yes, this is something the private sector could do. You may be asked by your clients to do this. Sometimes the government people ask, would this be possible? I don't recommend doing this. I think this is going a little bit too far. Um, <laughs> pursuing defense personnel. This is an example where this gentleman in the picture in the center, he was caught in a so-called honey trap 
where he fell for someone posing as a um, someone who was interested interested in him romantically, and basically this honey trap got him to spill a bunch of Pakistani ISI intelligence service uh, information. So the equivalent of the Pakistani anonymous said, "I know what we'll do. We're going to." be honey traps for all of our intel people. We're going to fish them all. We're going to LinkedIn them all. We're going to connect to them all. And we're going to try to get information out of them. And anyone that does it, we're going to turn them over to the government. OK, guys, like turn it three notches down. That's a little bit too far, in my opinion. Um, basically attacking your own intelligence service to show how bad they are. I, don't, I think that's going a little bit too far. Uh, five minutes. Um, this is another one that, that was really interesting. Uh, those are Delta Force guys in Libya. And how were they outed? The Libyan Air Force posted their pictures on Facebook, on the Libyan Air Force Facebook page. And someone noticed it and said, hey, what's Delta Force doing in Tripoli? And of course, as soon as that happens, the swarm of open source Intel people jumps on it and says, well, I can track where their plane was because there was a photo of the plane and they get the tail number. and Pretty soon, this entire thing is outed, and the guys had to leave the country. Um, just because some people who weren't thinking good OPSEC posted pictures on Facebook. Actually, the Libyans were probably like, hey, look at us. We're with Delta Force. These guys have big guns. This is cool. Put it on Facebook. And boom, there you go. Oh, and immediately, there's analysis of it, right? Immediately on Twitter, people are talking about what's going on. What does this mean? Whatever. The final risk I'll, I'll leave you with is, is personal. And this also involves you. Um, uh, one of the Kaspersky researchers put together an academic paper about this, talking about risks to individuals who are doing this sort of open source intelligence. And he talks about, uh, or, or one of the people, I think it was an ESET researcher, talks about when he was doing analysis of Stuxnet, uh, finding out that his apartment had been broken into and someone had put um, one of those little, um, little toys where you shake it and it gives you a little message, yes, no, call again later, whatever. Uh, they had the, whoever the intruder was had left the take a break sign pointed upwards, meaning, hey, stop for the research that you're doing on Stuxnet. So I can think of who that is and given, given let me put it this way, I doubt, I doubt it was us. There's another country who is very aggressive. Um, I'm studying Krav Maga. Uh, that gives you a hint who I think would do something like that. If you know anything about Krav Maga, these guys are direct to the point. We're getting our message through. Um, so this, this could, I don't want to say this could happen to you, but you never know, right? This, this is a whole other area. It's great that we have all these capabilities, but, you know, we might have to watch ourselves. So I hope with this presentation, um, I've exposed you to a little bit of the wider revolution in private sector intelligence, but I've also made it relevant to what's been happening here. So if you haven't seen some of these things, um, you should do it. And I would recommend, um, Obviously, you haven't read the APT1 report, I've got to say, read that one. But um, re read these two. You know, this is from our world here in the cyber world, the uh, Camershy report. And then this is from outside our world in the bigger geopolitical world, the uh, Hiding in Plain Sight report from Atlanta Council. So with that, um, happy to take questions quickly. Good first, thank you. Excellent uh, presentation, very stimulating. Thanks. Um, I wonder if you could elaborate a little bit on the malware.lu example that you gave. Yeah. And specifically, why you consider it going too far? Uh, is it because of harm to um, bystanders, or is it because of the uh, I I imperfect uh, collaboration um, uh, association between the IP address ranges, um, or some Ill illegality or, or ethics? You know, what specifically do you think is too far in that? Yeah, I think taking exploitive activities uh, are. are Breaking into somebody's computer to gather evidence is a little bit too far. I, I'm in the camp that says, let's leave that to law enforcement, leave that to the intelligence agencies. I feel like when we start doing that, we might lose a little bit of our moral authority to the extent we have some. So anything that involves uh, launching exploits to get into somebody's system, I think is a little bit too far. Now, if you scan those systems and you find web servers on them and they're just serving up pages, that to me is in essentially public domain or an open FTP server or something like that. But when you have to uh, do remote code execution to get access to it, I think you've probably stepped a little bit too far. Uh, sir, 
Uh, thanks. It was an uh, awesome uh, presentation. Oh, uh, yes. Hey, I was wondering if you could comment on, um, uh, because it's a private sector and ultimately the profit motive drives the private sector. So you have government folks who are reluctant or suspicious of private sector intelligence because ultimately the organization's goal is to make money. And that can slant intelligence or slant um, sometimes exaggeration of the threat, which we see a lot in, 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 in cyber in particular. Um, and the, the, I just want to defang one counter argument very quickly is that sometimes when we ask these questions of private sector intelligence organizations, they'll say, well, we're interested in protecting the nation too. And we would never do something, right? And, and to which case I bring up the 2008 financial crisis where an industry, the financial industry collectively basically committed suicide almost uh, in pursuit of money. Um, what, what assurances can you offer or what comments can you make to, to, to counter that argument for government customers who may want to consume these products? Yeah, it's a, it's a perfectly legitimate question. I think reputation is where it's at. Um, reputation and brand. So if someone comes out of the gate with a new report, I've never heard of this company, I've never heard of this group perhaps, I'm going to be a little bit more skeptical. But if it comes from a shop that over time has demonstrated they put out good things and they pan out and there's, their sourcing is good. It's funny, we're, we're having to turn into academics. You know, the best reports, as far as I'm concerned, they cite other sources, they're very specific, they pull in experts from other fields. There's a whole set of things you can look at to tell if a report is on the way to being a good report. Um, if you see, and this is where it's funny, some of the reports from the other countries out there who just aren't there yet, you know, they just make these assumptions and they don't give you any references or or citing anyone else, um, I dismiss those. So I think reputation is one of the biggest um, defenses you can use. Yes. Hey, hey, we Richard. work together. This, this, will be a, this will be our last question. Okay. All right. Um, yeah. So I, I think we've already seen this in the more advanced users of social media, but, and thank you for the presentation. Um, but do you think that we're gonna, so we've already seen some clumsy attempts by the Russians and the Ukraine and other people this, I, I think what we're seeing now is we're seeing a surge in this crowdsourcing of open intelligence, but you can hack crowdsourcing. There was a recent article about a DARPA challenge in 2011 <clears throat> that was crowdsourced being totally screwed up by one or two determined people. Mm. Um, do you think that this is going to last without people messing with it, or do you think there's going to be a, a counterintelligence surge towards screwing with people doing open source intelligence yeah. in the near future? Such a wonderful question, because so often in our field we have a very static view. Like, you do cyber hygiene and you're okay. Well, no. That's not true, right? If this is an iterative process between offense and defense. And it's the same thing here. So as you see people have success with this approach, uh, determined adversaries are going to figure out counters. Now, that by itself will tell you something. Because who has some of the better OPSEC in the world? Us, the Russians, the Israelis. People have been doing this stuff for a while. So when you can't determine who an attacker is, that immediately puts me thinking into a certain number of categories about who these guys could be. You know, they're probably more the high end. Um, so yes, this is a problem. Um, it's almost like internet voting, right? Or, or just voting in general. When the stakes become high enough, people figure out a way to break it. So we will have to be cognizant of that as you take a look at this analysis. I would hope we would get to the point where we have enough counters so that this just doesn't, is, is useless. I mean, you could imagine just because I showed a picture of what looked like a uh, SC-24 and an IL-76, those could have been giant blow-up dummies, right? Like we used in World War II, or actually were, were the Serbs used in, in 96. But we're not there yet because these guys are being caught off, off guard. They didn't expect that we would be able to photograph them. It's a good question. Well, thank you, Richard. It's great to have you back again. Thank you. Great talk. <laughs>